the seal of the Lord be upon you. He placed you in the name of the Lord. James, <coughs> chapter 1, verse 22, the New American Standard Bible. James writes, but prove yourselves doers of the word, not fairly hearers who believe themselves. In 1984, Wendy's Restaurants Chain produced an iconic and effective ad campaign. Little old lady opens her sandwich with an agitated look, shouts out, Where's the beef? The phrase has been used in many and varied applications to question the quality or genuineness of everything from personal relationships to political promises, especially the political season that we're going through. We wonder sometimes, Where's the beef? You know? Give, give us something to chew on here. Well, on Judgment Day, I wonder if Jesus will be asking people, and especially Christians, where's the beef? You know, for those who are not Christians, those who reject Christ's offer of salvation, um, he'll just be asking, you know, did you off, you know, did you accept the offer? And they say, no, and you would depart from me, but for Christians, it's okay. Now, where's the beef? Show me the receipts. Show me why you deserve a home in heaven for eternity. The book of James is the most practical book in the New Testament. James does spend a lot of time on doctrine, though you can see doctrine shining through in what he's trying to pull out. James deals with how doctrine is to be worked out in our lives. He deals with the primary properties of religion. And James is prompting us to question ourselves. Is my religion real? And to answer the question, we must first address two other questions. The answers to these questions have implications for the genuineness of our religion. Number one, how genuine is my faith? My faith can be habit instead of conviction. Habit instead of conviction. In Amos chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, and we talked about this when we were studying uh, the minor prophets, hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah, that's like a, a small bushel uh, basket, that's how they would measure their produce, make it small, and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. It wasn't so much about, you know, going to worship God in these times of, of the new moon festivals that they would have, the Sabbath days that they would need to, to go to the worship, whether it be the synagogues or whether at the temple. All right, let's get this over. I've got things to do. I've got business to conduct. I've got, I've got people to take advantage of. Well, my faith can be based on ignorance instead of truth. It, faith habit instead of conviction but it can also be based on ignorance instead of truth and there are a lot of people like that again back to the minor prophets but Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you've rejected knowledge I reject you from being a priest to me and since you have forgotten the law of your God I also will forget your children uh, there are a lot of people who base their Christianity on sayings. Sayings that come off the internet. Sayings that uh, come in uh, 
shall we say, religious type books, things that uh, people have said. Now, look, there are things I, I like to read books that come from different authors. I, I like C.S. Lewis material a lot of it. But we have to remember that what C.S. Lewis was writing was not scripture, it's not God's word, but it can help to clear up things in God's word. But we can't substitute C.S. Lewis writings, C.S. Lewis sayings for God's word. Because it does that we're really basing our faith on them. and subjective opinions of what God is saying. We really need to have to get, we really need to get into God's Word, understand what God's Word would have us to do, what God desires from us. Uh, another point is, uh, my faith may be a matter of convenience instead of devotion. In Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, Malachi writes, A son owners his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name. But you say, How have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, How have we polluted you? By saying, The Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present, uh, present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show your favor? Show you favor, excuse me, says the Lord of hosts. So the idea was, you know, hey, it doesn't really matter. We can give God seconds. We can give God the leftovers. Uh, we are very blessed. Uh, or at least we think we are. You know, God only wants a couple hours on Sunday morning, maybe an hour, maybe an hour on Sunday evening, and an hour on Wednesday evening. Uh, but the rest of the time's for us, right? You know, that that's our time, and God should not impinge on our time, but but really, the whole thing is God's time. And uh, God demands the very best of us. He wants the very best for us. And wanting the very best for us, He expects us to be giving the very best to Him. So, it's not just a matter of convenience. It's not just a matter of well, what can we get away with? What's the least that I can do to make God happy? I don't think that'll work. You know, that won't even work with my wife. What's the least that I can do to make my wife happy? It, it won't work. It just there's always something else or something more, more, more. You know. Well, that's just human nature. It's not a matter of convenience. Imagine, imagine Jesus coming to this earth just about the time that the Romans are going to nail him to the cross. He said, wait a minute, you know, this just isn't a convenient time. I think I'll hold off on this. It wasn't very convenient for God the Word to become a human being. Go through what he went through and suffer on the cross for our sins. We're not here on this earth for convenience. We're not here for our lives to be convenient. We're here to serve God and to serve His purposes. My faith can be nothing more than a covering over the worldliness. In Amos chapter 6, verses 3 through 7, one of the charges against the children of Israel. O oh, you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine and bowls 
you know, just a, a cup isn't big enough. You've got to have it in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils that are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. And that would be particularly the, the tribe of Ephraim. Remember, Ephraim was the center of idolatry for the nation of Israel, a tribal area. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. Yeah, that, that covering from worldliness. I, I, I'll go, I'll, I, I, I'll give my two dollars to God, and boy, that's all that God expects. I can live however I want to. That's all God cares about. That that little bit I put in the collection plate, or, or that little bit of time I spend in the church pew uh, thinking about, oh, what the cowboy's going to do today, or what, what, what am I going to do tomorrow at work, or, you know, what big project do I have to, to get accomplished this week? Where's the heart? Where's the mind? See, faith, faith has to be a part of that. So we might ask, where's the beef? Where's the beef when it comes to our faith? Is my religion more like a beehive or a cemetery? Hmm. Is it lively and busy, or is it lifeless and inactive? And that's a tough thing, you know. To describe religion. What, what are we talking about? Religion. Uh, one's man, one man's treasure is another man's junk. One man's junk is another man's treasure. However you want to put it, it works out the same way, doesn't it? it and one man's religion may be another man's junk. How many religions are there in the world? We don't know. But there's one thing we can know is that all religions are not evil. They can't it's an impossibility. You can't line them up, examine them, put them side by side, and say, you know what? It's all equal. It's all the same thing. It's impossible. My religion can be all appearance and no action. A hornet's nest can be a scary thing. But if there are no hornets around, it's not scary. The cemetery scares us, right? This reminds us of death. But it's nice to see those workers out there mowing the cemeteries, the bean eaters and stuff, doing the work to keep them nice. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 and 28. What about appearance and action? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of Democracy and lawlessness. I love some of those television shows that speak of the older times. Little House on the Prairie. Isn't that a wonderful show? The Waltons. All kind of religious sentiments throughout and, and such. But you look at that, and all those people are actors. John Boy was an actor. Little Beth, what was her name? But Laura. Laura Angles. Yeah, Laura. 
she was an actor. And that preacher, he was an actor, and the, the preachers in the Waltons, they were actors. All of them were actors, and boy, you know what? They could act really good. I wonder what their lives were really like. Now, I don't want to be judgmental. But what I'm saying is that as human beings, sometimes we're pretty good actors. The scribes and the Pharisees were pretty good actors. They had a lot of people fooled, but, but they couldn't fool Jesus. They really, they didn't feel fool a lot of people either because there were a lot of people that rejected them. There were a lot of people that turned away from religion as a whole because of these people. But then when they saw somebody like John, the immerser, and gave them the opportunity to repent, telling them, hey, there's a kingdom coming where it's righteousness and good things. And, and listen, here's how you can be a part of that. And here's what's expected of you in it. And it's not walking around in fancy clothes and this and that. It's here's what soldiers can do. Here's what ordinary people can do on a day-to-day -day basis, and that can be a, that's, that's religion. That's religion that's useful for people. Not appearance, but action. Here's what you can do. My religion can be all reputation and no Christian character. Think about that. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It's one of the letters to the seven churches of Asia. To the angel or messenger of the church in Sardis, right? The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, a beehive, but you are dead. You're a cemetery. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. You see how that all works together? You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. But there's still hope, right? Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die that cemetery part. Why? Jesus says, for I've not found your works complete in the sight of my God. There was something God wanted them to do that they hadn't done or that they weren't doing. They were doing some things, but it wasn't complete. So they needed to find out what it was that they needed to complete that work so that they could be pleasing to God. See, reputation typically is what people think about us. Character is what we are. And character is what God is looking for, is what God is looking for. What's our character like? What, what, where's, where's the being? My religion can be all talk and no activity. Look at that in this. This isn't James. This is Peter. Peter chapter 1 and 1 Peter chapter 2. I want you to notice the verbs. And what do we know about verbs? What are they? Action, action words, right. Action words. So, uh, what are the action words that Peter is calling us to perform, I might say. Not perform in the sense of acting, but perform in the sense of doing. Well, 
how about start off with rejoicing? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. And in this you rejoice, though for now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. See, it wasn't all peaches and cream. There were some hard times that they were going through, but even going through those hard times, they were supposed to be rejoicing. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, testing so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found in re to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have, we're supposed to go through testing. Uh, I don't know, when I was in my younger days in school, I didn't like test days. I didn't like testing. You know why I didn't like testing? Because I didn't like to study. If I didn't study, I knew I wasn't going to get a good grade on the test. So along with that testing comes the things that has to lead up to the test. Loving, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So yeah, that, that loving part of it, uh, uh, you love Jesus. Why love Jesus? Because of what he's done for you. You believe in him, I uh, see, the believing is part of that, but also there's that rejoicing once again. Obtaining. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls, it's not just absolutely something that's given to us. We have to obtain it. What does it mean to obtain something? You have to grasp hold of it. Preparing. 1 Peter 1.13, that's like preparing for that testing. Therefore, preparing your minds for action. Yeah, uh, something bad happened today. I wasn't prepared for it. Why not? Only prepare for good things. I think only good things are going to happen today. That, that's, that's having a positive attitude. Well, I'm positive that bad things can happen today too, so I'm going to take a little bit of caution in some things. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to prepare for action just in case. Because it's not me. I've got a family that I've got to take care of and a family to protect. Conducting. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 17. Are you a conductor? Stick your finger in the light socket and see if you're a good conductor. <laughs> right. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. And that, that fear means a, a respect. Yeah, a little bit of fearfulness is there, but a fear for God and, and respect for God's things. They were going to be in exile to a degree, uh, separated. Um, and in separation, they, they would need to, uh, I was looking, I think they got preparing and conducting, switched around there, didn't they? From there to here? No, there's preparing and conducting. Okay. Now I lost where it was at. Conduct yourselves with fear. What's your conduct like? Do you have respect for God's things? Even though, oh, we, we talked about this before. Hey, if you're in a foxhole, you don't care what the other person, what language are they using. <laughs> you, you, you want to survive. So, but you, you know, what is your lifestyle like? How do you conduct yourself to be an example even in those times of uh, exile, those times when you are separated from the church. I 
and I don't mean uh, separated uh, in a sense of apostasy, but I mean separated physically. You can't get there for the assemblies. Uh, you're separated from your brothers and sisters in Christ. Can you stand alone as a Christian? Or are you going to revert to worldly things? Uh, Obey, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. He writes, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Obey. Obedience to the truth. Well, we have to understand what the truth is and understand it before we can obey it. But always being true to God's word and God's ways. The putting away there, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. That word put away is the same as divorce. And what happens if a, a man divorces his wife or a wife divorces her husband? Uh, put them away. And that's typically when it's translated in the scriptures. Put away. Send them away. Well, we're supposed to put away or send away malice and deceit and hypocrisy, envy and all slander. It shouldn't be a part of our uh, behavior. Abstaining. 1 Peter chapter 2, 11, abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. That's difficult, isn't it? Because the flesh is always wanting its way. The body, the body wants its portion. You've got to keep it under control. Uh, submitting, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, be subject to the Lord, uh, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. What does that mean, every human institution? Well, it means the government. The government. And as long as the government isn't making a rule or a law that uh, contradicts God's law, well, we should be in submission to that. Uh, look at all some of the teaching of Jesus, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar. Uh, pay our taxes. Hey, we can grumble about them. We can try to get our taxes lowered, but, you know, pay your taxes. Don't, uh, as, again, as long as it doesn't conflict with God's Word. So, we got all that stuff. That's a lot going on, isn't it? But that's only a sample. There's a lot of it. And we've got to keep going over and over and over these things. There's a place where, where Peter talks about some things and he says, uh, I know you know these things, but to, I need to keep you in remembrance of these things. So that's why we preach these things, we teach these things, we remind one another of these things. This tells us there are things we must be doing if we are to be real Christians, if, if our religion is to be real. Uh, so we can someday say, when we're asked, where's the beef? We can say, well, here it is. You know, may not be perfect, but, but here is the beef. James chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. If anyone thinks he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, that doesn't mean it's limited to that. All you have to do is uh, take care of orphans and widows, but that's going to the poorest. Okay? We should do good unto all men, but especially those of the household of faith. But the widows and the orphans were, what do we say, they, those were the lowest rung on the civilizational ladder. Sometimes slaves were better off than orphans and widows in those days. To the least. What did Jesus say? When you've done it up to the least of these, my brother, you've done it up to me. So again, it's not everything about being a Christian, but it's a good start at the actions of being a Christian. So 
So much of what's called Christian today is not matched with the New Testament description. God knows genuine Christianity when he sees it. Be certain your religion is alive and real. And you know what? That includes me also. So I get to preach to the preacher. All day long. <coughs> Little sermon there. Where's the beat? Where's the song leader? You have me, please. Let your request be made known as we stand and sing.